we are. Lesson number 47 in our chronological journey through the Gospels. Today, it's going to bring us to two of the Gospels. We're going to look at our first two points from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. So I would encourage you to go there first. And we're going to look at the signs of the times. I think this is appropriate for what's going on in our day as well, in verses 1 through 4. And then we'll also see the doctrine of false teachers in verses 5 through 12 from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. And then we'll go over to Mark's Gospel, chapter 8. This is something that only Mark tells us about. None of the other Gospel writers uh, tell us about this, but Mark is tracking with Matthew on our first two points. And so then he follows the first two points with this account of Jesus healing a blind man. And so I titled that point, A Blind Man's Faith. This uh, message from the Word of God, it really seems very timely to us, to me, because Jesus in this passage, he ends up chiding his disciples for not discerning the times. And then he points out and warns his disciples to beware of false doctrine. To them, it was the false doctrine of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. But for us today, to beware of false doctrines that are in our world today, and maybe the best line that I have in this whole message, perhaps, is the tagline of our second point, the only protection against false doctrine is learning sound doctrine. And so I'll say that one again for us later on. But to endanger a false doctrine that's out there even to this day, we need to be aware of that. But we also need to have sound doctrine to counter that in our lives today. And then finally, we'll look at Jesus touching and healing a blind man. And it's actually a a two-stage healing. Often Jesus would speak the word or he would touch someone or someone would touch the hem of his garment and they would be healed. But this one came in two stages. And I believe there's a lesson for that for us today as well. So today we're looking at a message that I entitled Discerning the Times. And it is our 47th lesson in the Chronological Gospels. And we're going to see today the signs of the times in Matthew 16, verses 1 through 4. We'll also see the doctrine of false teachers, Matthew 16, verses 5 through 12. And a blind man's faith in Mark 8, verses 22 through 26. So we begin in verses 1 and 2 of Matthew 16. We're looking at the signs of the times. And Jesus said then, The Pharisees and the Sadducees came testing him, asking that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And then in verse three, and in the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the t- signs of the times. So one through three, Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and we also learn from Mark that the Herodians were there as well. And so the Pharisees, like 400 years earlier, we would have loved the Pharisees 400 years earlier of the timeline of Christ because they were pretty much the back to the Bible guys. They wanted to get back to the truth of God's word. But after 400 years, it became more about tradition than it did about the very word of God. But they still held to some of the truths that countered the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in the spirit of God. They believed in eternal life. They believed that there was the resurrection of the dead. While the Sadducees, they were another religious sect in Israel, but they didn't believe that there was life after this life. They were living for the here and now. And the Herodians were there, a group of people who were Jewish, and they were saying, you know what? The 
King Herod's line, that's good enough for us. King Herod originally uh, and his offspring that ruled after him, so King Herod the Great, Herod the Great, was there at the birth of Christ, but then you had other Herods rule after him, his sons ruling after him, uh, Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, but it was basically, they were of the Edomites, so they were not Jewish, they were not of the Davidic line, they did not descend from King David, they were not even of the nation of the Jews, and yet there was a group that said, you know, this is good enough. We're kind of living in peace. Rome's happy with how Herod is ruling over our nation, so we'll just go with the status flow. And so they were content to have a non-Jewish king ruling over them. And so you had the Pharisees, the back to the Bible guys, the Sadducees, those who did not even believe that there was life after death, and the Herodians were thinking the status quo is good enough. And they came to Jesus, and they were seeking a sign from heaven. Show us a sign was the name that they cried out to them. And Matthew has told us once before the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming together. And at that time, they were coming to John the Baptist. And John cried out to them a very harsh but truthful message in Matthew 3, 7, saying to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, brood of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. And it would almost seem that John the Baptist did not want the Pharisees and the Sadducees to be baptized to prepare their hearts for the coming of the Messiah. But he knew that they were not bearing fruit worthy of repentance. He understood that there was hypocrisy in their lives. And after the death of John the Baptist, the religious rulers then set out on a plot to destroy Jesus. In Mark eleven eighteen. it said the scribes and the chief priests, when they heard it, they sought how they might destroy him, destroy Jesus, for they feared Jesus because all the people were astonished at his teaching. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Mark tells us also that the Herodians were here as well. They were asking for a sign from Jesus. And they were kind of saying, show us a sign from heaven and we'll believe that you're the Messiah. But what would it take? And Jesus, at this point, we are in his third year of ministry. There had been many signs and no doubt they had seen several signs but they were still refusing to believe that Jesus was the Messiah of the first coming. Jesus condemned them. He knew the true motive of their hearts. Besides seeing the signs, it doesn't always make people true believers. Back in John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, when he was there at the feast of Passover there in Jerusalem, the word tells us that many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. He had no need that anyone should testify of man because he knew what was in men. He knew what was in their heart. They had seen the signs. They believed, but they really didn't believe with an understanding faith. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they knew how to forecast the weather as well as they, probably as well as any weatherman today. They still, with all the technology that we have, they still don't get it right all the time. But they had an understanding. They could look at the sky. They could determine from a night sky what the morning might be or from a morning sky what that day might bring. They knew how to discern the weather, but they did not know how to discern the sign of the times. For them, it was talking about Jesus' first coming. And this remains true for many today in our world. Those who might be wise in the ways of this world, there are some we might even describe as geniuses. And there could be those college and university professors, some who know how to read Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, the three languages that are found in our Bible. 
They may know those old languages inside and out, but they are not able to discern the signs of the time because they don't know the God of the Bible. They have an intellectual knowledge without a heart knowledge. And Jesus said to this crowd in verse 4, A wicked and adulterous generation seek for a sign, but no sign shall be given except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Then he left them and departed. The only sign that he was willing to give that day was the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now Jonah was a wayward prophet who refused to obey the will of God, who had called on him to proclaim God's judgment to the people of Nineveh. Instead of doing the will of God, being obedient to the word of God, Jonah tried to run, the Bible tells us, he attempted to run from the presence of God. But even somewhere in the middle of a stormy Mediterranean sea, Jonah would discover that there's no place that you can run from the presence of God. And the Lord would get his way with Jonah by a stormy sea, by a ship full of sailors, the ship's captain, a great fish. Jonah would be given an opportunity to do the work of God that God had called him to. And he would go to Nineveh. He hated the fact that he was going. He didn't want to go in the first place, and he would even blame God in Jonah chapter 4 when God relented from bringing harm to the Ninevites, basically, Jonah would say, see, I knew you would do this because you are a compassionate God. That's why I didn't want to come in the first place. We just wasted a lot of time. I don't even think that Jonah, he didn't want to be there. The Ninevites were enemies of Israel. They were the Assyrians who had who would conquer the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten northern tribes, they would take them into captivity. They were a wicked bunch. And if you think about it, God told Jonah to go and speak my judgment against the Ninevites. He didn't tell Jonah to speak to the Ninevites, a message of saying, repent, the kingdom of God is here. In fact, when he finally got there, all he said was 40 days and you guys are going to be judged. We never read of Jonah calling them to repentance. They did repent. But it seemed that they repented because of a very angry prophet who didn't want to be there in the first place. But that's not what the Lord is talking about here. What the Lord is talking about, the sign of Jonah was the three days and the three nights that he spent in that fish. In Matthew 12, Jesus had spoken about this before. We're in Matthew 16. He said the only sign that you're going to be given is the sign of Jonah. In Matthew 12, he draws it out for us. Matthew 12, 39 and 40, he says, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of that great fish. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus prophetically was referring to Jonah's three days and three nights in the belly of that great fish and looking forward to his own time at his death where he'd be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, over the last few weeks, I learned something about ancient beliefs and the significance of the three days and three nights. In an ancient saying, three days and three nights had this meaning of that they were long enough to be definitely dead long enough to be definitely dead. Have you ever wondered why, especially not in the Jewish culture so much because they tend to bury very quickly, but we have, and, and this has changed a lot just because the expenses of doing funerals and such, but there was, you know, quite often in my younger years, it was customary that they would have a wake and then they would have 
the funeral, the wake part of that was basically waiting. You're waiting to make sure the person was actually dead to see if they would wake or not. And so they'd just give it a little time, didn't want to prematurely bury someone, um, and they would not actually be dead. And so they had this custom of waiting. And here we have with the three days and three nights and the ancient custom of waiting three days and three nights, the saying would be three days and three nights, would be long enough to be definitely dead. A testimony of Jesus Christ in the grave, three days and three nights. It actually argues against those who argue against his actual death by saying, no, he didn't die, he actually passed out. He swooned, and the coolness of the tomb brought him back to life. No, he was dead, and Jesus rose again from the de- grave. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 3 and 4 tells us, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I have also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. Three days, long enough to be definitely dead. But Jesus did not remain in the grave. He rose again. No sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. And that referring to his three days and three nights in the well, the whale. I don't even know why I say that. It's, uh, it's a, two Hebrew words that mean a great fish. And the Hebrew word, they don't even have a word for whale. So we shouldn't even get, the, you know, it's just we grew up with it, right? It came out and I didn't even say the word right when I said it. But uh, Get that out of our mind. I believe that God, for his, his purpose, prepared a great fish. And it does say that God prepared a great fish and for that purpose at that time. So the signs of the times then was pointing to Jesus' first company, coming. The signs of the times today points us towards Jesus' second comings. Jesus, uh, he talks about the signs of the times in Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, And here I'll wrap up just a few of the things that he talked about, and then I'll read a portion of Matthew, or Luke 21. At that time, he said it will consist of, these signs will consist of wars and commotions. They will consist of nations and kingdoms rising up against one another. There will be earthquakes, famines, pestilence. There will be fearful side signs from the heavens persecution and prison. There'll be betrayal, death, and hatred. Have you recognized any of these things going on in our world today? And then Jesus said, Luke 21, 25 through 28, there will be signs in the suns, in the moon, in the stars, the earth, in distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing from fear of expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud in power and great glory. Now these things, when they begin to happen, look up, lift up your head, because your redemption draws near. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, that the sons of Issachar, they had an understanding of the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. We need to be a people today who have an understanding of the times, a discerning of the times that we would know what we ought to do. Our second point we find still in Matthew 16, verses 5 through 12, the doctrine of false teachers, the danger of that doctrine. In 5 through 7, Jesus said, I keep saying Jesus said, and Jesus isn't speaking. It doesn't start off with him speaking at this point. So 5 through 7, the word of God says, Now when the disciples had came to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Now, I'd mentioned the Herodians before, and this is actually 
where Mark tells us of the leaven of Herod. And so he brings in Herod in this portion, not the first portion. That's found in Mark 8, 15. But they're on the sea. Jesus warns them about the leaven of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the leaven of Herod. Now, leaven was a common Jewish metaphor for an invisible, pervasive influence. In a sense, leaven is often seen in the Bible as a corrupting influence. Paul would write in Galatians 5, 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Just as sin can get in and permeate the lies that it touch. And the disciples thought Jesus was shiting them about not bringing bread. Oh, he's mad at us. We forgot to bring bread. But Jesus was warning them about the danger of false teachers and the false teachings of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians. Jesus warning his disciples to to not regard the outward piety of the Pharisees and the practice of religion because they had no inward change in their hearts. Beware, in Luke 12, 1, he says, of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a Greek word that means to put on a mask. It is what they use to describe their actors of their days. They would put on a mask, they would change characters, and it came to speak about deceit and falsehood, and the disciples thinking that Jesus was shiting them because they didn't bring bread. They totally missed the point. He was talking about spiritual things when they were thinking about physical things. I am getting a little hungry. Jesus is talking about bread, and you're making me hungry, Lord. It's like I'm not talking about physical food here, boys. I'm talking about spiritual food that you need and the danger of false doctrine. In fact, Jesus would go on to say in verses 8 through 12, Oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand? And remember the five loaves and the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up. He's asking them a question. Remember when I fed the 5,000, how many baskets did you take up? Their answer is like 12. How about when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves? How many baskets did you take up? And they were large baskets, the Lord said. The answer was seven. And then he said in verse 11, How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but that of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He condemned them for having little faith. He reminded them of all the leftovers that they had at the feeding of the 5,000 where they took up 12 baskets of food, of leftovers, at the feeding of the 4,000 where they took up seven large baskets of leftovers. By this time, they should have understand that when Jesus was in their presence, they didn't even have to really worry about physical need. But the Lord was speaking to them about their spiritual need. They were still thinking about physical when the Lord was trying to drive home a spiritual point to them. And there's some lessons. I have three things that I laid out that we can learn from this passage. At the feeding of the four and five thousand, the crowd left satisfied physically, but it was a Satisfaction that would not last. And though the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they found satisfaction with their outward piety, their physical gratification would not give them eternal life. And 11 of the 12 disciples, they would ultimately come to realize that true spiritual sustenance comes by having a relationship with Jesus Christ that would last them on into eternity. I had said that the crowd of the feeding of the 5,000, 
Though they were filled up, they were fully satisfied. We learn the very next day at the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6, 26 and 27, that the people came seeking after Jesus who said to them, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw a sign, but because you ate the loaves and were filled, you were satisfied. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food that endures to everlasting life, which the Son of God will give you because God the Father has set his seal upon him. Jesus warned his disciples, don't get distracted with the false doctrines of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians. And yet it's a warning that we need to heed to this day. Believers, we can get distracted. We can get distracted with the physical stuff. Now we hear of banks collapsing in our nation and we might be thinking, well, what about how are we going to eat? How are we going to feed ourselves? How are we going to pay the bills? And we start thinking about the what ifs of tomorrow when the Lord tells us, and, and we're right there with you. We're thinking about the what ifs of tomorrow. And the Lord said, don't worry about tomorrow and what it may bring. For today has a, is sufficient. The troubles of the day is sufficient in themselves. And yet we tend to worry like that. We need to hold on to God's faithful word. Titus 1.9 says, Holding fast to the faithful word as it has been taught, being able by sound doctrine to both exhort and convict those who contradict. And only Jesus, he can provide this true sustenance in our lives that lasts on into eternity. And so the only protection against false doctrine is learning sound doctrine. And so we need to be a people of God's word and stand firmly upon the truths of God's word. It will help us to beware of false doctrine, to be aware of the false teachings. We may not have Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians today, but we have their types. We have people who have false doctrines that are teaching false doctrines today. And uh, we should shy away from those things. Oftentimes when I get an understanding of a false teacher, and sometimes we get sucked into something and it starts off pretty well. It seems like things are pretty good and the truth is being proclaimed properly. And then suddenly we realize that they're saying things that are contrary to the word of God. Some people might say, well, you know, they're at least like uh, 80% of what they're saying is truth and it's only 20% bad. So I just kind of throw the bad aside. I don't listen to that. I just listen to the 80% that's truth. Well, for me, when I start hearing a 20% that's, that's wrong, I just shut the person off altogether. It's like, all right, this is a false teacher and I don't want to get mixed up with hearing what they have to say. But the only way that we're able to recognize false doctrine is by learning sound doctrine. So we need to be a people of God's word, a people who are attentive of the sign of the times and a people who are willing to allow God to work in our lives. Our last point for today, a blind man's faith, but the point I want to make for us out of this is that sometime God will work in our lives in stages to build our faith. And so that's something I want you guys to just be aware of today, that sometimes God works in our lives in stages in order that he might build our faith. So the healing of this blind man at Bethsaida is unique because of two reasons. Mark is the only one that tells us about this. We don't read about this man from Bethsaida in any of the other Gospels. And also because Jesus works in a two-step process in this man's life. So he works in, in a two-step process. We begin in verse 22, where it tells us that he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. 
So Bethsaida was going across the Sea of Galilee, and we've talked about Bethsaida a bit. It's the area in the deserted place of Bethsaida where Jesus actually fed the 5,000. And so he has been traveling quite a bit. He went from Bethsaida, which was northeast of Capernaum. Uh, He went over to an area that was east, about 10 miles east, where many were healed. He headed west again over to Capernaum. He headed northeast over to Tyre and Sidon. We looked at this last week. He's back in the region of the Galilee again, and he goes across the Sea of Galilee, and he's back in Bethsaida once again. He's actually making his way to to Mount to area of Mount Hermon, where it's believed that it was the mountain of transfiguration. So he's making his way to Caesarea Philippi, which is at the base of Mount Hermon. And Bethsaida was kind of on that route. If you look at your Bible maps today, you can kind of figure this out. And the mountain of transfiguration, it's believed to be Mount Her- Hermon because The word will tell us, and we'll get to this very shortly, that he went up on a high mountain. And in Israel properly, there is no real high mountain. But north of Israel, there is Mount Hermon that is up around 10,000 feet or more. And so he's making his way ultimately to Caesarea Philippi, and he'll go up on a very high mountain. It's believed to be Mount Hermon. But right now, he's in the area of Bethsaida where family members or friends brought a blind man to Jesus. And in their action or by their actions, they show that they desired for Jesus to do a work in this man's life. In fact, they asked Jesus, heal him. So once again, we have a great example of either family or friends bringing someone to Jesus. And Jesus, we have learned often over the last several months that Jesus would often work in behalf of someone's life because of the faith of family and friends. And it's significant for us to kind of know this, that the Lord will work because of the engagement that we might have in someone's life. It could be because we're praying for the individual. It could be because we're reaching out to the person, to the individual. And you could be today reaching out via uh, a message through our social media or maybe a text that you send. Maybe it's physically reaching out to someone that you know has need and especially has need for Jesus. But Jesus, he would often work in behalf of, of a friend. Remember the paralytic and the four friends that brought their friend to Jesus in Mark's gospel, chapter 2, where it tells us in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you. So Jesus acknowledged he saw their faith, the faith of the friends. Then he said to the paralytic man, the man on the gurney as they couldn't even walk. They carried him to Jesus and he began to do a work in that man's life, not only forgiving his sins, but ultimately causing him to walk again. When Jesus saw their faith in Mark 2, 12, the people, when they saw it, they were amazed and glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this before. Jesus worked because of the faith of friends, of family, He still does that to this day. I encourage you to continue to bring your family member, your friends to Jesus. It may be just by lifting their name up in prayer. It may be that your faith gives your friend, a family member, an opportunity for Jesus to do a work in their lives that causes their faith to be ignited. So I was mentioning that. I just remembered a bricklayer that I used to work with when we were both apprentices. And uh, he did not walk with the Lord when I knew him as an apprentice. And then years later, we happened to be on a job together. We were both journeymen bricklayers at that time. And years later, he was then a believer. 
And he shared with me that when he finally came to like his brother or his sister's church and finally gave his heart to the Lord, he said, people in the church said, we have been praying for you for years that you would give your heart to Jesus. And they happened to see him come and do that. Don't discount our role in someone else's life for the Lord to do a work in their life. It could be that our faith for an individual that has no faith might be enough to cause that individual that their own faith would be ignited to believe in Jesus. So back in Mark 8, verses 23 and 24, he took the blind man by the hand. He led him out of town. And when he spat on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw any things. And the man looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Now, I think of someone spitting in my face, and I think, gross. One of the commentators said the things that Jesus was doing with this man were, were things that he could experience. Remember, he had no sight. So feeling, feeling the spittle and the hand of Jesus touching him, it was kind of the physically engaging with this man. For one side, it seems very gross. Lord, just lay your hands on me. You don't have to spit on me. But if your spittle brings healing. But here's what I want us to notice. It was a stage of healing. What do you see? I see men like trees walking. Kind of gives us the idea that this man, this particular man may have had sight before. Um, because he knew what people look like. He knew what trees look like. And maybe without sight, he would have somewhat of an understanding. But it was a stage. Why the Lord took him out of sight at this time? It's the year of opposition, and, and we'll find that he warns him not to tell anyone. And uh, the Lord is kind of wanting to spend more time with his disciples, but he's willing to help those with need at this time. And so he begins to do a work in this man's life. As I mentioned last week, the Lord would often heal in different and various ways. Last week, I, I had mentioned to one blind man, Jesus touched his eyes and he could see to another man, this man, he spat on his eyes, put his hands on him and, and brought healing to Barnabas. The Lord would say to Barnabas, go your way, your faith has made you whole. And that was sufficient for him to be made whole. To a man who was born blind, Jesus would spit on the ground. He'd make some clay. He would anoint his eyes with the clay. He would go and tell him to go wash in the pool of Salome, a word that means sent. So he sent him to go wash at a particular place in a particular pool of water. And he came back seeing and the healing of these men shows us that there was no set formula in Jesus' work in individuals' life. He ministers to each one of us uniquely that he might strengthen our faith. So it was the faith of family and friends that got the man to Jesus. But at this point, Jesus was engaging with this man one-on-one. -on -one. And it took a little spittle, a little laying on of the hands things that this man could physically experience that he began to see. His healing came in stages. And, and here's one of the points that I want us to take out of this. There's a verse in Exodus. When Jesus, when Moses is telling the children of Israel in preparation of entering into the promised land, God speaking through Moses in Exodus 23, 29 and 30, God tells Moses, I will not drive them out, talking about the enemy that was within the promised land. I will not drive them out before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, Exodus 23, 30. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. So God preparing the children of Israel to enter into the promised land. 
He said, once you get in the land, I'm not going to drive them out all at once because their population wouldn't be large enough to fill the land. So we're going to do this in stages, little by little. As you grow as a people, you'll continue to drive them out until the enemy is out of the land. And I believe in a similar way that God, he does not take all of our shortcomings, our sins, and remove them instantly. I believe that he can and sometimes he does. But I've come personally to understand that the Lord at times does these things little by little in order that we might build some spiritual muscle. I wish I could make a real muscle these days, but that we could build spiritual muscle. And that's how it is in weight training. You don't all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I can bench press 500 pounds. Nobody can all of a sudden bench press 500 pounds. If they can even do that, they have worked their way up to that. Spiritually, God does that for us as well at times. And I believe with this man, his healing came in stages. He said, what do you see? I see men as trees walking. And then verses 25 and 26, he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and he saw everyone clearly and so again he was restored as if the man had actually had sight once before and he saw everyone clearly and then jesus sent him away to his house saying neither go to the town nor tell anyone in town so another touch from Jesus brought this man complete healing in his life. In Philippians 1, 6, it reminds us being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. I'd mentioned a few weeks ago of Jesus often trying to keep people from telling others of what he had done in their lives. In this situation, the Lord sent this man to his house. He said, don't go tell him in town. Just go home and celebrate with your family. I believe it's at this point, he just didn't want the premature attention that would ultimately lead to his being crucified. We are in that final year at this point. Jesus will not return to Jerusalem until when he comes, they'll be crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so his path now is leading him to the cross. But Jesus is not telling us as believers in Jesus Christ today, don't tell the town, just go home and talk to your family. Just tell your friends. Now he's saying, Mark 16, 15, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. I am so thankful that Jesus works uniquely in our lives. He does this in order to increase our faith in him. He works in stages sometimes, little by little. And are you letting Jesus strengthen your life little by little? Today we've learned in our chronological gospels, lesson 47, I titled this Discerning the Times. We have seen the signs, signs of the times, and I'd ask the question, are you discerning the signs of the times? Back in Jesus' day, he was talking about the sign of his first coming. But today, the signs of the times refer to that of the Lord's second coming. Are you discerning the signs of the times? Are you being careful? Our second point, the doctrine of false teachers. Are you being careful of what you're allowing your ears to hear, what your eyes to read? And the only way that we can rightly protect ourselves against false doctrine is by learning sound doctrine. And finally, a blind man's faith. I love it. Mark only gave, gives us this account. None of the other gospel writers wrote of this, but... I really love it. He worked, Jesus worked in this man's life, first of all, because friends brought their friend to Jesus. That's a great reminder for us, the power of the Holy Spirit working through individuals, through their prayer life, through their service to others, that maybe to help some, someone's faith ignite, 
through our prayers, through our service to that individual, by bringing our family members, our friends to Jesus, but also Jesus working in our lives, working in an individual lives, doing so by stages like he did in the healing of this man. As we looked at with Israel entering into the promised land, Jesus worked in the man's life in two stages. Jesus said to Israel, I'm not going to let you take all of the land all at once, but little by little. And I believe when the Lord works that way in our lives, he's doing so because he wants to build our spiritual muscle. And I think that's important for us to be those who are striving to gain strength spiritually in this world. When we are so often distracted by physical things. Father, thank you for your word you've given us today. We pray, Father, for your grace to be upon us. We thank you, Father, for this word. It was written years ago, but talking about the signs of the times and discerning the importance of discerning false doctrine. These are things, Lord, that we need to be aware of to this day. It may have been written nearly 2,000 years ago, but Lord, the timing is perfect for us today. And also, Lord, as believers in you, or maybe, Lord, as those who have not yet believed, the importance of us rec recognizing, Lord, that often you will work in our lives in stages, that you might strengthen our faith, so today, Lord, you may be saying to us individually, what do you see? And perhaps, Lord, things are right now a little cloudy. We don't have clarity on things that we have been desiring to hear from you. I pray, Lord, that you would then touch us again, that you'd bring clarity of understanding in our lives. For some, Lord, it might be the clarity of knowing you as Savior for the very first time, Lord, understanding that you are the Savior of the world, that you died and you gave your life that we might be saved. For others, Lord, it might be a desire to bring clarity in a situation that we've been seeking you about. And today, Lord, you're, you're asking, what do you see? Maybe, Lord, we haven't really thought about it. Maybe we haven't properly responded. Maybe, Lord, today we need to cry out to you, touch us again, Lord, that we might see clearly. Help us, Lord, to be a people, that we would be a people, Lord, who do have a right understanding of sound doctrine, that we might know how we ought to walk in this world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As you stand together, you can see Pastor Kevin is down front for those who have prayer need, but also the prayer benches are available for you as well to come. And maybe today it's the Lord saying, what do you see? And your prayer today is, Lord, help me see clearly. I don't know what the issue is, but Jesus knows. Lord, work in our hearts today. Pray that God would bless you and keep you, that his face would always shine upon you and give you peace. God bless.